not good lighting in here. That's okay. Yeah. We'll be looking at the slides then. Right. <laughs> but you can. I'll scoot over. I'll scoot behind you. There you so go. You yeah, that's great. Okay, here we go. Hello. Welcome everyone. We'll just give it a few moments for people to join and then we will introduce our speakers today. And Dr. Robinson, um, if you would, oh, there it is. Great, I can see your slides, wonderful. Okay, so we are right at the 12 o'clock hour. Thank you everyone for joining us for our Baptist Behavioral Health Grand Round Series. I am Dr. Francesca Varello sims Director of Education and Training. Uh, before we begin, just a few notes on today's presentation. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat or the Q&A box. Um, I'll be moderating that throughout. And at this time, if you have joined through a mobile device, if you would please sign in with your name and credentials into the chat. Uh, please let me welcome our speakers today, Dr. Robinson and Ashley Hart McLinn. Dr. Sarah Robinson is a licensed psychologist and board certified behavior analyst who specializes in working with patients with neurodevelopmental disorders. She received her PhD from SUNY at Stony Brook. She joined the Baptist team in 2018 and has more than 30 years of experience treating behavior disorders. Dr. Robinson's primary focus is working with people of all ages who have autism spectrum disorders or developmental disabilities. Her areas of expertise include parent training, childhood behavior and anxiety disorders, as well as intellectual and developmental disabilities. Ashley Hart McGlynn is a board certified behavioral analyst and joined the BBH team in March 2022. So pretty new, but you know, season still, right, Ashley? Uh, she received a Master of Science degree in ABA from St. Cloud State University in 2013 and has over 14 years of experience serving families and is part of the Applied Behavior Anal Analyst team uh, providing outpatient care at both Baptist Downtown and Lake City locations. Her specialties include functional communication training, behavior reduction, and independent living skills. Welcome to you both. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for having us and thank you all for coming. Uh, good afternoon. So I want to talk and give you some general background information first about autism spectrum disorders, which we will also refer to as ASD. Um, so a broader category is actually neurodevelopmental disorders. And ASD is part of what we call neurodevelopmental disorders. And these are disorders that um, occur during the developmental period. So they really are evident early on in childhood. They affect multiple areas, personal, social, academic, occupational, and they are likely to be something that will persist into adulthood. They are not things that are just there in childhood and go away. There are things that persist and carry on and are probably going to be a lifelong condition for the person. They have high comorbidities, so several of them can occur at the same time. And they're more common in boys than in girls. So in the DSM-5, the conditions that are called neurodevelopmental disorders include intellectual disability, various language disorders, um, articulation problems, stuttering, what we call social pragmatic communication disorder, ADHD, specific learning disabilities, developmental coordination disorder, stereotypic movement disorder, and tic disorder. And then of course, autism spectrum disorder. So it's part of this kind of broader continuum. Autism spectrum disorder is a spectrum. And then it's part of an even broader category or broader spectrum. 
So when we talk about autism spectrum disorder, we're talking about a disorder that affects social communication where people have deficits. And then people also have these excesses, these unusual restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. And within social communication deficits, we look at social emotional reciprocity. And remember autism is a spectrum. So we're talking about a range of different ways this can manifest itself. But it may be something as significant as someone who doesn't interact socially at all, or it may be more subtle. It may be somebody who can have a great conversation if they're talking about their own preferred topic, but they cannot have a back and forth conversation. So they can tell you everything there is to know about planets, but they cannot talk about the weather. So they can't have that back and forth kind of conversation. They may lack an ability to really be, respond appropriately to somebody else's distress, to show empathy or compassion or concern for them, not because they don't have that compassion, but they don't really know how to respond in that situation. Um, one of the very early things we look at with young children is something called joint attention. And joint attention is this looking at an object, looking at a person, looking at an object, back and forth to communicate. So using eye gaze to communicate. And this is one of the things that early on, if a child does not have joint attention, it's one of the major things that is a predictor or an indicator that the child may have autism spectrum disorder. So what I'm talking about is something that many of you may recognize. If a child sees something, a toy, that they think is very exciting, they look at the toy, they may look back at the adult, look back at the toy, okay? And they use their gaze to communicate, look at what I'm looking at and enjoy it with me. And that's what we mean when we're talking about joint attention. Uh, Nonverbal communication is another area where there are deficits in that, both in using nonverbal communication, eye contact, facial expression, gestures, as well as understanding that. And eye contact is important, but it's not just eye contact. It's how somebody uses eye contact. So right now I'm going to make eye contact. And I don't know if you can see that, but I can overly make eye contact. You know, I can stare at somebody and that's not appropriate either. So what we're talking about is how that is used by the person. We also look at relationships and friendships. If the person's able to maintain those, we, the other area is restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. So stereotypies, whether the person has any kinds of unusual movements, hand flapping, finger play, you know, kind of gait, pos uh, this odd kind of planing, posturing. So we look at those. We look at whether the person has inflexible routines and rituals. So this may be a child who insists on brushing their teeth before they get dressed. And if someone else is in the bathroom, they have a total meltdown over that. Maybe driving in the same way every time. It may be an adult who has very rigid kind of thinking patterns that they insist that this is the only way that you can think about something and this difficulty understanding a different point of view. People may have fixated interests. So they may be interested in dinosaurs or a teen or adult who's interested in anime, but to a greater degree and extent than other individuals would be. And then we have sensory differences. The person may be hypersensitive to not noise, pet, touch, texture of foods, any of those types of things, they may be hyposensitive and seek out more sensory stimulation. So 
the CDC's current uh, calculation is that one in 44 people in the United States has ASD, one in 44 kids. That's a lot of kids, okay? That's a lot of people. There's greater male to female ratio. So CDC says four to one. Some other studies have it slightly different, but definitely more males than females. We used to think that about 80% of kids with ASD had an intellectual disability. There has been an increase in prevalence in ASD. It used to be when I started in this field, it was two to four kids in 10,000 was what we thought the prevalence was. Now it's one in 44. And a lot of that increase has been in higher functioning individuals. So now figures are about 33% have an intellectual disability, much lower, okay? So we're talking about a lot of ind more individuals with a normal or above normal IQ, above average IQ. Um, it used to be that prevalence was different based on region or even county with wealthier counties having a greater prevalence of ASD. So it was more likely to be detected in individuals where people were wealthier and often where people were white. Um, that has changed. And so as the prevalence has increased and as awareness of it has increased, there's almost a catching up so that it's more representative of the general population. So why has the prevalence of ASD increased? There are a number of different reasons. One of these is change in diagnostic criteria. You know, the criteria for autism in the DSM-2 was really, really narrow. And DSM-3, 3R, 4, now we're to five. And with each iteration, what's been included in this spectrum of ASD has gotten broader and broader and broader. And so with that change in diagnostic criteria, more people are being diagnosed as having ASD who previously would not have been diagnosed with the other criteria. And some studies have looked at populations and what, you know, what the prevalence of the diagnosis was when in this population, you know, they take a sample of a thousand people that they, and look at how many of them have a diagnosis of ASD. And then they've gone back and evaluated those individuals to see if they now have ASD with the current criteria. And in doing that, then they get prevalences that are like the current prevalences. So the, uh, what that means is if, if in the 1970s, 1980s, we'd been using the DSM-5, then we probably would have gotten rates like we're getting now, but we weren't using the DSM-5 at that time. And so a lot of this change, increase in prevalence is due to these broadening, changing in diagnostic criteria. There's also much increased awareness. You know, I, autism is no longer what we used to call the A word. Um, it's not something that people don't talk about. It's something that many people are very aware of and will say, I wonder if my kid has autism. You know? So there's much more increased awareness as well as acceptance, which means that more people are likely to be detected. There's some indication of diagnostic substitution. Some studies have brought that into question if that's really what's going on. But there's a certain component that's also substituting the diagnosis of intellectual disability with the diagnosis of ASD. So, you know, individuals might have previously gotten one diagnosis, now they're getting a different diagnosis. 
So causes of ASD. There is a genetic component to ASD. If a, you know, if a person has one child with ASD, they're more likely to have another child with ASD. In terms of twin studies, identical twins are more likely to have both twin have ASD as fraternal twins. I actually worked with identical triplets who all had ASD. Um, and the thing that was interesting about them is they did not all look the same. They looked physically the same, but they did not all present their ASD presented very differently in each child. And in the twin studies, all identical twins, if one has ASD, it's not 100% that they all have ASD. So there's a genetic component, but that's not the only factor. There are a number of genes that are being studied that have been identified as probable risk genes that increase the risk of having ASD. But again, none of them solely causes ASD. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There are a number of medical conditions that are associated with ASD. Again, they're not 100%, but they increase the risk of ASD. And they, ha they are genetically, you know, they're inherited disorders. So things like PKU, Fragile X, Rett syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis are all associated with ASD. Children who have a low birth weight are more likely to develop ASD. That's a risk factor. And older parents are too, although we are at this point not quite sure why older parents are a risk factor for ASD, but we do know that they are. Maternal infection can cause ASD. So we don't have a lot of rubella right now in this country, but I have worked with a number of the individuals who are a product of the last rubella outbreak where a number of pregnant women got rubella when there was a rubella outbreak in this country in the early 60s. Um, rubella is relatively mild for children, but if pregnant women get it, it causes some serious birth defects. So these kids are born with often deaf or deaf and blind, often have intellectual disabilities, often have autism, ASD. And so maternal rubella is a risk factor for ASD. Vaccines are not a cause of ASD. There have been many, many, many studies on this and vaccines are not a cause of ASD. One thing that was proposed is that thimerosal, which is a preservative that used to be used in vaccines, has mostly been faded out of childhood vaccines. But the thought was that this was causing ASD. It was faded out in different countries at different times. And so what that did is it allowed people to sort of research and say, well, if it was faded out, say in Japan earlier than in the United States, then, and the vaccine were causing the ASD, then the rate should go down in Japan while they're still going up in the US. And that's not what happened. What happened is the prevalence of ASD kept increasing regardless of whether the vaccines being used in that country had thimerosal in them or not. And thimerosal has been faded out of vaccines, most childhood vaccines for quite some time now, and we're still seeing the prevalence increasing. So that there's a lot of research on this and that is not a cause of ASD. Um, another thing that happened was Wakefield, a researcher in England published a study in The Lancet, a medical journal that purported a relationship between 
GI issues, leaky gut type syndrome, and ASD, and the MMR vaccine. So the idea there was that the MMR vaccine was causing people to develop these GI issues that were then related in causing ASD. That article has been retracted by The Lancet. All but I think one of the other authors have retracted this. There has been some research to show that data was manipulated, like a data set with this subject was placed with another subject to make it work. Um, Wakefield has lost his medical license in England. However, he continues to tour and promote this idea that vaccines are causing autism. And what I would say to that is that there's been a lot of research on this. Vaccines are not causing autism, but something is, okay? And there are a lot of other variables that could be invested and spending the time and money looking at those things would probably be more profitable in helping us figure out what is causing ASD and what maybe we could do to prevent it and what we could do about this. There are a number of medical mm -hmm. conditions that are associated with ASD. And I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, GI issues, sleep issues, intellectual disability, learning disability, seizures, what I want to note for this is that it's also associated with an increase in depression, anxiety, psychosis, and OS OCD, sorry. So when we're seeing individuals in a behavioral health setting, and keep in mind that now with the broader definition, most people with ASD are higher functioning one in 44 kids, an increased risk of depression, anxiety, psychosis, OCD, we're going to see them in a behavioral health setting. There have been a number of studies on using psychotherapy with kids with ASD. Parahan did a meta-analysis of CBT for anxiety for kids with ASD and found that it was very effective with kids with ASD. It was more effective if the intervention were longer and there were more parent involvement. Lipinski et al. did a survey and keep in mind it was just a survey, but it was kind of interesting. They asked people who had different diagnosis about what was helpful to them, what modifications they would like in a therapy setting. And they had this for people with anxiety, depression, you know, OCD, autism spectrum disorder. And then they compared the people, the answers for the people with ASD to people with depression, but not ASD. And they found that the people with ASD preferred a consistent date and time for their appointment and not changing rooms, being in the same room every time. And that makes sense because people with ASD like to have things stay the same. They don't like changes in their routine. And so even though they may not be able to express it, they're not like a little kid who's gonna have a meltdown or a tantrum, this is going to increase their anxiety. And it's something that for someone else might not be a big deal, but for them may increase their anxiety. Um, they also found that people like clear structure to the sessions. So they like to know exactly what was going on, you know, what the agenda was, why they were here. And I will tell you in my own practice, I find that too. You know, if I don't make it clear, especially to teenagers and why they're here, it's like, well, why I, we're done now, right? Why am I here? What do I have to do? If I start a session with a very general question, like what's been happening? What's been going on with you? That is really a problem for many of my patients. They don't know how to respond to that. They don't know what the answer is. There's not a script for that. There's not some structure for that. 
So, you know, I'm, I still ask the question, but I then say, well, what are things you can do to answer that kind of question? When people ask you that, what are things that you can say? You know, can you say, well, I'm doing pretty good, or I watched a movie last night. You know, how can you respond to that? So if there's not a clear structure and you sit down with someone and you're asking them kind of general questions about how they're feeling, or you're expecting that patient with autism to start talking, they either may talk nonstop about a preferred topic which is not very helpful, and you may have to impose some structure, or they may not know what to say, and you may feel like you're not getting anywhere in therapy, that you're kind of pulling teeth because there's not, they don't know what the script is. They don't know what the structure is, and they need some kind of clear structure. When I work with young kids, um, but who are verbal, I bring them in and after a couple of sessions, I often will do one of those therapy games you can get, you know, where there are little cards and it asks questions. And I don't really like those in general, but when I do that with the kids, they will often answer the questions because it's a game and there are rules and there is structure and the game says, when you pick up the card, you have to answer the question. If I ask without that, they probably won't answer the question, you know? So having that structure can be helpful. Having a low stimulus environment, so not something that's too noisy or crowded or overwhelming or busy can be helpful. Modification for sensory differences. This was not something Lipinski and all found, but I'm just gonna add that to the low stimulus environment. We often have to make modifications for people with ASD who have sensory differences. So I have fidgets in my office. Here's my favorite, but you know, I have all sorts of fidgets in my office and the kids know where they are. And if I don't put them out, they will say, where are the fidgets? And they can use fidgets during my entire appointment, okay? Because that helps them to self-regulate. I have idiosyncratic things that different patients want. I have one person who wants the lights off. I have another person who doesn't like the play mat on my floor. So we have to roll it up and put that away. I have another person who doesn't like sniffling. You know? So knowing what these individual idiosyncratic sensory differences are can be really helpful. Lipinski and all also found that use of written language to communicate with the therapist was a preference. So writing something down, there's less of a social component can be easier. That could go either way. I know I have some patients who don't wanna write down anything and that is anxiety provoking. But I do have patients who come in also and might share pictures that they've done. You know, they'll come in with a picture of artwork they've done and want to communicate that way. Or they'll want to show me a video they relate to or have me listen to music. You know, so they may want to do something in a less social communication way because it's less anxiety provoking. Direct feedback and explanations. People with ASD tend to be very cut and dry and direct. Doesn't mean they don't get their feelings hurt, and you don't have to be sensitive to that, but I'm often more direct with my patients with ASD than I would be with other people because they're not going to get it unless I tell them. And if I tell them nicely, they're usually appreciative. They just want to be told. They also need explanations of other people's behavior and perceptions because otherwise they don't really understand. They lack what we call theory of mind. They don't understand what other people are thinking or perceiving. And so they need feedback on that. I had a situation the other day where we were talking about not being so direct. And I gave the example of, well, you know, it wouldn't be okay if I said to someone, if I said to Ashley, your hair's a mess, you look awful. <laughs> okay. 
And the, the child replied to me, oh, I tell that, people, that to people. And they say, oh, thank you for telling me. And she said, so they're very appreciative of it. And I wouldn't mind if someone told me that. You know, so then I have to give the feedback that, well, actually they probably don't like it and they're probably being offended and hurt and they're being sarcastic to you, okay? So I don't do a lot with those situations of, well, what do you think the other person might feel? Why do you think they responded that way, okay? Because they really don't know. You know, so I don't do a lot of this very insight oriented type thing. I just tell them, I tell them very directly and explain those things to them and explain what they could do instead. I also do some explanation of idiomatic speech. So if I say cat's got your tongue and the person's looking at me strangely, I will say, oh, do you, that's an idiom. Do you understand that? Uh, a lot of my patients like metaphors. They'll use metaphors, but it can be helpful to say, now this is a metaphor, so that they don't take it literally. With my kids, I also do a lot of play. Um, I've gotten very good at, while I'm planning my moves in chess, asking questions that I need that might be anxiety provoking to them. So I ask them the question, they can answer, and then they can make their chess move. So I lose at chess. I'll say that's the reason, not just that I'm a bad chess player. Um, I also play Uno a lot. That's another good one. But you know, playing games, incorporating things into that kind of situation can be less anxiety provoking than sitting in a room facing somebody and trying to talk about how they're feeling. And a lot of the patients I work with don't even know how they're feeling. So sometimes we have to work on how you feel, how you label what you're feeling, what another person might feel in this situation so that they can label those things. All right, so at Baptist Wolfson here, we have outpatient behavioral health focused ABA services. And Ashley is gonna explain what that is. We have therapy, outpatient behavioral health therapy. We have medication management. Within the Wolfson system, they have a whole rehab system for speech, OT, physical therapy. And they have a very special center, the Autism and Neurodevelopmental Center that was designed specifically for young children with ASD or who are suspected of having ASD to receive speech therapy and occupational therapy. And if you ever have a chance to visit, it's beautiful, but they have OT and speech therapy there. Wolfson also has a feeding clinic. So we're talking about not eating disorders, but feeding disorders, pediatric feeding disorders, which many kids with ASD have because they don't like the textures of certain foods. And so rehab actually has a feeding disorders clinic. We also have inpatient services in both our child and adult psychiatric units. Um, Ashley and I consult and we try and develop services and individualization and modification to help the patients who have ASD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. And so now I am gonna turn this over to Ashley and she's gonna talk about ABA. Hello, um, my name is Ashley Hart McGlynn. I provide ABA services outpatient at Wolfson's. I actually do outpatient in the Autism and Neurodevelopment Center and the Children's Center, which is where we are right now. It's the South Bank building. I help Dr. Robinson in the hospital as well. And I also go to Lake City to help do ABA services out there. So. If you know anyone who needs those in Lake City, that is me. So let's talk about applied behavior analysis. So um, when a child is diagnosed with ASD, oftentimes parents say, I heard applied behavior analysis is the treatment that we should seek. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> it's a scientific discipline and it focuses on behavior and environment and how the environment affects behaviors, 
we use scientific principles to make meaningful behavior change. And what that means is based on what behaviors we're seeing in the environment, we teach different skills. So that's really an important component to applied behavior analysis. Um, if a child is engaging in dangerous self-injury, aggression, we teach them how to do a more appropriate behavior to replace that one. And we'll get into that some more. Um, and also when we do apply behavior analysis, we collect data on everything that we're teaching. So um, for example, if I am teaching a child how to request a break, I would take data on every trial of if the child needs a verbal prompt, if the child needs a visual prompt, um, every trial that I do, I'm collecting some type of data and then that dictates my treatment decisions. So if um, I'm not able to fade my prompts, then I might try a different one. So the assumption of ABA is that all behavior has a cause, it has a purpose and a function, and that behavior is communication. So um, if you're engaging in aggression, if you're engaging in tantruming, you're trying to communicate your wants and needs. So think about this. If a child who has autism cannot verbalize what they want, think about if they could, if they could speak in full sentences. So if I took a toy away from somebody who is nonverbal, what they probably would say is, hey, why did you take my toy away? I really want it back. But they don't have those skills yet. And so we need to teach them to say something like toy or um, car or whatever it is that they're wanting instead of throwing a tantrum, throwing themselves on the ground, hitting, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about the functions of behavior. So there are four main functions of behavior. Um, it is access to attention access to a preferred item or activity. And then we also talk about automatic reinforcement, but it's also sometimes called sensory stimulation. So examples of sensory stimulation, Dr. Robinson touched on this, it might be hand flapping, it might be flicking lights on and off. A lot of my patients love to line things up. Um, some make noises repetitively, and that's just something that they're doing for that feedback to themselves that might be trying to regulate their own senses. Attention is more so if um, a parent or someone else is dividing their attention to someone or something, and they're not getting that adult attention, they might engage in some problem behavior to get that person's attention. So, um, think about if you ask nicely for something, hey, can you come over here, please, versus screaming and yelling, you're going to get a better attention response if you're screaming and yelling. Um, for item or activity, if something is removed, if a child is told no, if a child is told to wait, that oftentimes results in getting upset because they want access to that item or activity. So those would be examples of positive reinforcement. Something is being added to the child's environment. And then we also have the fourth function of behavior, which is escape. So that's also referred to as negative reinforcement, which can sometimes be confused with punishment, but it's actually not. It's removing a stimuli. So if I ask a child, um, I want you to go clean up your room. If the child doesn't want to do it, they might cry, they might whine, and they do that because they wanna escape the demand. Um, if I ask a child a question and they look away or they run away, that might be, they want to escape the social interaction. Um, and then there's also escaping pain and noise. But the, the top two, escaping social interaction and escaping demands is typically what we see in our children. You know, this can interfere with daily living skills like brushing teeth, brushing hair, getting in the car, putting on a seatbelt, putting on shoes. So it really impedes their learning and language because the parents are really focused on trying to get these kids to do what they need to do to just interact with their environment and be successful. And 
if they're trying to teach them how to say a word or play with toys and they just are engaging in negative behaviors, that's really difficult as well. Okay, so let's talk about some antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. We call these the ABCs of behavior, easy to remember, right? So an antecedent is also known as a trigger. So what triggers the behavior, what causes the behavior is important to understand because oftentimes you can predict what will cause a behavior. For example, every time I tell Susie no, she starts to cry and throws herself on the ground in the toy store because I told her she couldn't have a brand new expensive $200 toy. And so sometimes what happens is she gets the toy because mom and dad don't want to cause a scene. Um, you know, other triggers that are common for our patients, ask to wait. Okay, wait, and then you can have it. They don't wanna wait. They don't know um, maybe what that means or how long it's going to be to wait. So that's an unpredictable situation for them. So that can be difficult. Um, if someone is talking to someone else and their intention is divided, that's another trigger that might cause some maladaptive behaviors. And so oftentimes when we talk about behavior, we're not talking about a, a positive behavior. We're talking about something that is interfering with daily living. So we want to teach a better, more effective behavior, a new skill, a way to communicate so that the child is more successful accessing what they need. So uh, especially if someone is not familiar with the child, if they're crying, whining, and can't express their wants and needs, you're just guessing what they would like. But if they were able to vocalize or show you what they need calmly, then you would be able to give them access to that item. So it's really important that we look at these triggers we try to change the environment so that if we know we're going to tell the child to wait, perhaps that we'll say something more like, let's wait and let's count to 10 and then you can have the item. I just have to go get this. So you might do something more predictable that way. If you're telling a child no, instead of just saying no, you might say, let's pick something else to do and teach them to picks a new item. If you know you're taking away an item, you might teach them to ask for a little more time for the item. You might ask them to, you might teach them to ask for something else. Um, but you really need to focus on what can we teach the child to do instead of engaging in that maladaptive behavior. Because if they do engage in that behavior, are they going to get what they want or are they going to not get what they want? And that's the problem we run into a lot with parent training is, well, I know every time he cries, he wants attention or he wants a bottle or he wants his favorite toy. So I give it to him to get him to stop crying versus every time I know he wants something, I'm gonna teach him to ask for it appropriately and then give it to him. So the we have to shift our way of thinking. We have to shift our time and energy to, if the desired behavior occurs, then the child will get what they want. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about different providers. So there is masters and doctoral level, level behavior analysts and BCBA stands for board certified behavior analyst. Um, and typically in a, clinic situation, in-home situation, we provide oversight and training for BCABAs and RBTs. We're the ones who make the treatment program decisions. We're the ones who look at the data and observe the patient to make sure that uh, the programs are being successful. And so <clears throat> oftentimes you'll find a BCABA or an RBT working directly with the patient. And they're the ones that are collecting your data for you. They're the ones that are implementing the intervention.
Okay. So some different ABA techniques, functional behavior assessment, that is identifying what the function of the behavior is. We talked about that. Um, systematic instruction. So a lot of times when people think about ABA, I know that they think about trials over and over and over again, repeating, 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 sitting at a small table, and that's all that we do, but that's actually not the case, depending on who's doing the teaching, but hopefully that's not the case. So, you know, a lot of our teaching is naturalistic. We do a lot of what we call manned training, but it's really requesting and teaching the child to calmly ask for things versus crying. We do a lot of naturalistic teaching. So, you know, Dr. Robinson talks about playing games and sneaking in questions in games. I might give the child a toy and give them free access to toys, but in the meantime, I might be holding some of them and I might have a blue ball and I might say, hey, what color is this? And they'll say blue and I hand it to them. And that is an example of naturalistic teaching. I'm sneaking in different things to teach skills. Um, and I just wanted to add to that, if I'm teaching the color blue, for example, and I've asked, hey, what color is this? And they've gotten it wrong several times, then I would change my intervention and I would add a prompt. So my data would show that. So this is much different than um, when I say naturalistic, it still is natural in the environment, but I'm still collecting data on those trials and I'm still gonna make decisions based on the data. Reinforcement is very, very important in behavior analysis, finding motivation, finding what the child really wants can change the entire course of your session, your therapy session. Um, when they're not motivated, they're not gonna do what you've asked of them. Oftentimes children with autism do not have that intrinsic motivation. They need some extrinsic motivation at first and then we pair it with intrinsic. So finding that toy, finding that activity that they like to do and making it very clear, if you do this, we can go do this. Um, if you answer three questions for me, we are going to go to the playroom. If you answer five questions for me, we can, we can play this game. Um, and that kind of leads into prompting and shaping. So at first I might expect them to answer only one question and then we get to do the activity or one response, put in one puzzle piece. And then I'll systematically add more and more. So at first I might say, wait, and it'll be one second, they get the item. And eventually it will be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute. Um, and then maybe they don't know the time and I vary it. So it's very, um, like I said, systematic. Functional communication training, which um, Dr. Varela Sims said is something that I love to do is teaching communication based on function of behavior. So if I want attention, I'm gonna teach to tap on the shoulder or say mommy or say Miss Ashley. Um, and that will replace the maladaptive behavior. Another example of functional communication is if a child wants to escape an activity, I ask them or I teach them how to ask for a break. I might teach them how to ask for help. I might teach them how to say no. Um, so those are all things that can really prevent behaviors. And the key to a good behavior analytic plan, behavior intervention plan is to prevent and to teach behaviors because once behaviors have happened in your session, it's really hard to get back on track and be successful. Um, you know, as many of you know, you only have an hour, maybe less. And if 30 minutes of it is spent crying or 20 minutes of it is spent recovering from crying, not a lot of learning is happening. Um, so when we talk about behavior intervention plans, we also talk about what to do if the behavior occurred. Uh, so if you know the function of the behavior is attention and the child is yelling, screaming, crying, you wouldn't provide that attention for them because that would increase the future frequency of the behavior. Okay, so um, I run a functional assessment when I see a new patient. 
So I'll do a direct observation. I'll interview the parent. I do a records review, which is usually the, um, the autism evaluation. Sometimes I talk to the speech and occupational therapist if the child is being seen at Wolfson's already. I'll do a reinforcement inventory. So I'll ask the parent what they like. I'll also provide different toys and see how long they play with each toy, how motivated they are for it. I'll assess some of the skills that they have. Can they ask for things appropriately? Can they label things? Can they wash their hands independently? Things of that nature. And then I will manipulate some of the variables in the environment. So I might place a demand. I might take an item away. I might make them lose a game. I might not let them go first, depending on the skill levels to see what happens if I do that. And then I write my goals and my assessment based on that. There's two different types of um, ABA models. So we do the focus one at Wolfson's. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about the focused model. Typically it's one to 20 hours. It's focused on a few different skills. It can be done in any setting, uh, but it's usually for kids who don't engage in intense behaviors. But the comprehensive model is 20 to 40 hours a week. These are kids that are injuring themselves, injuring others, engaging in long tantrums, dangerous behaviors. Um, and typically it's for children two to five years old who maybe need a wide array of communication skills. They're missing a lot of skills. And as you know, this is the time that their language and learning is developing. So it's the best time to teach these skills. All right. So my outpatient focus model is one to two hours a week. I meet with the patient and their parent. So I provide parent training during the hour session. And typically for younger kids, we'll target communication, maybe waiting, some compliance listener skills. For older kids, we might target some specific social skills, some self-regulation skills. Um, and these are kids that are usually on a long wait list for younger kiddos, and they're waiting to get in more intense services, more comprehensive, and I provide them a list of um, resources. Or maybe they're older patients who go to school full time, and they just need to address a couple of behaviors. And... Um, Maybe it's just patients who are missing a couple of skills. Hey, um, I really need help with toilet training. My kid is seven, he can communicate effectively, but he's not being compliant with, with that skill. So can you help me? And I can do that as well. So insurance coverage for ABA must have a diagnosis of ASD. Some insurances also cover Down syndrome, and typically they need a test and report with an ADOS test in there. Really depends on the payer, really depends on insurance. Medicaid is the most stringent for all of these guidelines. Typically, ABA services are provided until age 22, sometimes 18. Uh, so I just wanted to include the process to receive ABA because it's a little more extensive than just making an appointment. You need an MD referral, sometimes a PhD referral and diagnostic paperwork that has the uh, diagnostic code in there. We submit it for authorization to do the initial. Then I meet with the patient and the caregiver, and then I write the report and we submit it with the hours request. So it's a, it's a two-step, three-step process. So it takes a few weeks. It's not just call and make an appointment. And then our, our authorizations are for six months. So I did provide some additional resources. Um, you know, this might be something to provide your patients or someone who maybe suspects that their child has autism. So there will be slides available for you after the presentation. So I know that you can ask for them in the e in email form. Here's some scholarships that can help our families. They don't necessarily have to have autism to access them. And here are the references.
Thank you so much, Ashley and Dr. Robinson. We really appreciate your time. So we have a couple questions. Um, I'm going to, in the meantime, while you guys are responding, pull up the um, evaluation links for the CE credit. So for the first um, question, any proposed causes of autism related to the nurture factor? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that was something that was the hypothesis about autism in the past, okay? That there was that something that was called the refrigerator mother, okay? That parents who were cold and detached from their kids were what was causing the child to have autism, which was a psychodynamic theory. Um, research subsequent to that showed that in fact, it was probably more likely that the child was causing the parent to behave in that way, okay? Child effects on adult behavior, okay? Because this is reciprocal. So if you have a child who doesn't respond to anything you do, you probably are less responsive to that child. And if they scream when you touch them, you probably don't touch them. You know, so then, so there really is not much evidence for this model the, that's really been discredited and we've moved on. Um, in terms of nurturing, I guess the one other thing I will say that I, is that there, we want to make sure that there's probably some overlap in terms of kids who have had a history of neglect or abuse who might have a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder, that some of the characteristics of reactive attachment disorder are similar to characteristics of autism. You know, so whether those are different things, whether one is causing some of those same behaviors, but that's probably you might get some of those same characteristics, but it may not be autism spectrum disorder. There may be some overlap of some of the symptoms. I don't know if I answered the question or if someone has further on that. Yeah, um, so it sounds like at the beginning portion, like a goodness of fit you know, sometimes was causing some of the um, you know, reactions between parent and child as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a general question of you guys, when you send me your updated PDF of the slides that yes, I will um, distribute this for those who do want it, um, you can email me um, and not everyone might want it. So I don't want to send it blanketly. So please do reach out to me. My emails on the original flyer uh, if you want the PDF, but maybe at that time I can also send um, the number and contact information to all of those resources that are affiliated. So um, I know, Dr. Robinson, you've been working really dil diligently to make those accessible via the website. And if that's not quite ready, maybe I could just have yeah. a list of the contact information to share as well. Yep. And thank you for that plug, because there yeah. is going to be a Baptist <laughs> Wolfson autism website so yeah. that people can go to. That will help with increasing accessibility and, and all of this very important information, you know, to try to remove some of those, you know, barriers to getting getting the treatment. Um, so a question is, if a family with limited funds needs the services, does Baptist or Wolfson offer, you know, services that would help them attain those or seek funding, kind of like a social work liaison role? Do we offer that for families with children with autism? <sighs> I, I don't know if we offer that exactly. You know, we don't have like a free social worker for individuals with autism. I know that with the Dragonfly program, they do help put people in touch with resources. And so I think that's, that is very helpful, okay? So it may not be a social worker, but it's someone who knows all those resources and helps connect families and helps to connect them to another place that they could go to get services. We do provide ABA services to Medicaid recipients. And so, as Ashley said, it can be a kind of cumber, they're kind of picky, you know, about what you have to submit, but we do provide Medicaid services through ABA. Um, and Medicaid also provides case managers, so they could true. always access their Medicaid case manager to help them navigate. That's true too. Yeah. 
And the resources on the last couple slides can help as well. Yeah. But it is very overwhelming for families yeah, who are newly diagnosed. Kind of navigate all this. Yeah. Right, which is why that yeah. that website, you know, is yes. really helpful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. To answer a question, a logistical aspect of the recording of this presentation will not be available in the learning system. But if you want it to review, I am recording it, and I can email you the link from um, Box from the Box account associated with our with our organization. So that is for you. Um, Another question for you guys is, would exposure therapy be, use, be a useful technique for patients with anxiety related to social interactions or noise? Okay. Um, those are two different things, but yes, I mean, it's all anxiety. So yes, the same general principles apply to everything. In terms of noise, what I would do and what I have done with individuals is start with something at a level they can tolerate, but may not like and then just gradually increase it. You know? It can get kind of complex because noise is often maybe just one specific noise. You know, I work with someone where then one of the th things was a certain beep or a certain classmate screaming, you know, and, and then it also can be the crowding too, and the environment. So it may not be just that sound, you know, so it can be a little more complicated than that. But yes, the general principle that you could expose someone to that applies. The same with social anxiety. With people with ASD, we can do similar things we would do with other people with social anxiety is gradually expose them to interactions. Can you go say hello to someone? Can you say hello to someone in the office? Can you, a teen, I might have them call someone up, on, call Publix and say, what hour are you up? What are your hours? When do you close? You know, just kind of practicing those skills. Thank you. Uh, to Marlene's question about the organization for resources. So that's our Dragonfly program. And they, uh, the individuals who do that are called care coordinators and they work in our Baptist Behavioral Health Department. And so you would call in to ask to speak with one of them. Um, or you can actually, I think, put a referral in through you Epic. You can put a referral into Dragonfly. Look at us being yeah. savvy with Epic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, one final question because we're over time. I'm so sorry. Uh, what are your recommendations for screen time, social media use, and gaming for youth with ASD? You're laughing. Do you <laughs> want to take that or do you want me? Just don't. <laughs> um, yeah. I think, you know, it doesn't matter if you have autism or not. That's not something that I would promote. The problem is, is that children with autism don't have those social and play skills. And so I think they're getting their leisure activities from screen time. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is then they get very fixated on the screen time. And then we see an increase of behaviors when they try to remove the screens. Right. So I do realize why they're getting the screens, um, but I would encourage them to maybe enroll their children in maybe a special interest group. So dinosaurs, Harry mm -hmm. Potter, outer space, trains, these kids usually love all those things. Mm -hmm. So finding social activities that um, they're interested in and having other peers interested in can really help them get out of their shell and away from technology. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent points, good place to end. Thank you both so much. And if you could just, um, you know, make sure that you guys send me, uh, there's somebody asking for the scholarship slide. Uh, it would be hard for us to retract to that because now we switch sharing, but I can absolutely um, get that to you. It looks like it's Deanna Jans. If you just want to email me directly, my contact information is on the original advertisement email flyer, and I can get you all of the, all the things from Dr. Robinson and Ashley. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're hopeful to have another Grand Rounds in November. We um, had a change in schedule, so be on the lookout. If not, we will resume in January, okay? But fingers crossed for November. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great afternoon, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us.